Hello from Ankara. We're driving about 200 kilometers east to explore an ancient capital of the Hittite Empire, Hattusa. Let's go! The archaeological site of Hattusa or Hattusha is located in the northern central Anatolia in the village of Boroskoy. More than 3000 years ago it was a capital of Hittites, one of the oldest Indo-European civilizations which ruled the majority of what today is Turkey along with the northern part of Syria. In the 17th century BC, the king Hattusili I, whose name means the one from Hattusha, began to build an empire, which lasted for over 500 years. We're beginning our journey at the rock sanctuary of Yazilikaya, located around 4 kilometers from Hattusa. Over 90 carvings adorning the sacred place date back to the 13th century BC. Yazilikaya literally means rock with writings. It now consists of two open chambers, A and B, made of natural rock. At the focal point of chamber A we can see two most important deities, the storm god and the sun goddess. Horizontal reliefs on the side walls present a procession of gods, male deities on the left and female on the right, all facing the same direction, as if they were slowly walking towards the supreme couple. However, the largest figure in the chamber represents the King Tutalia IV, as he probably finished the construction of this sacred place and naturally didn't want to be forgotten. Already here we might notice Egyptian influences as above the king's right hand, his name and full title are displayed in a form of cartouche. It suggested that the sanctuary might have been a house of the New Year's celebration, where each spring ceremonies took place to honor all the gods. We're now in the chamber B called the Tuthalia chamber. Tuthalia IV was one of the most important kings of the Hittite Empire. Interestingly, the reliefs on the walls are much better preserved than in the chamber A. That's because it was partly filled with earth and wasn't excavated until 1937. We are looking now at the line of 12 gods of the underworld, as this chamber might have been a burial place of Tutalia IV. On the opposite wall we can see the god Sharuma, with a significantly smaller Tutalia under his arm. Sharuma was a god of mountains, often represented as a bull. He was a son of the mighty storm god. Probably Tutalia chose him as his protector to support him during the journey to the underworld. By the way, Hittites didn't have a strict religious calendar. They usually connected with gods either to thank them when something good happened or ask them for help in hard times. 
I've noticed that in contrast to other ancient civilizations, the Indo-European ones almost always regarded the storm gods as one of the most, if not the most important ones. Might it be connected with the climate of their place of origin, the vast Pontic Caspian steppe? We're now in Hattusa in the lower city. In the 14th century BC, this place teemed with life. Priests, civil servants, merchants and craftsmen all lived here in houses made of timber and mud. Interestingly, many houses had a drainage system and some of them even featured bathtubs made of clay. The most significant building of the lower city, erected on a large artificial platform, was obviously a religious one. The Great Temple or Temple One was the largest edifice in Hattusa. It measured 65 by 42 meters. Passing the gateway, the paved street of the temple leads to the central shrine. Along the way, there are limestone water basins, which presumably were used in libation rituals. The site also features enormous blocks with towel holes. Some of the blocks reach even 5 meters in length and weigh around 20 tons. They served as a support for the walls, which no longer exist as they were made of timber frame filled with mud brick. In one of the storerooms stands a controversial green stone. Matt, this is specially for you. Its mystery has been brilliantly covered by the Ancient Architects channel, which I highly recommend. However unique this stone may be, I've got to tell you that I saw a lot of smaller green stones and pebbles all over the place. The courtyard, where most ceremonies took place, led through several antechambers to the holiest part of the temple, two cult chambers, which only the king and queen had access to. This is the lion basin used for libation rituals. Or not, it's also possible it was a monument base featuring four crouching lions. Originally, it was carved from one block of limestone. The whole temple complex covered an area of around 14.5 thousand meters square. The magazines surrounding the temple alone had 82 rooms. Since the 16th century BC, this wall protected the old city of Hittites. And these are the oldest fortifications of Hattusa. They were originally up to 8 meters wide and protected by the towers built at intervals of 12 to 20 meters. Heading up, we're passing by hard-to-miss cliffs of Sarikale, which means yellow fortress. And there it is. In the 13th or 14th century BC, on the top of the 60 meters high rocky outcrop, Hittites erected a fortress guarding the upper city. There's also a theory claiming that it was a significant religious place, used particularly for worshipping the dead.
we reached one of the most iconic places in Hattusa, the Lion Gate, one of the majestic gates on the southern part of the city wall. These huge polygonal limestone blocks instantly caught my attention. It's still unknown why some blocks fit perfectly, are trimmed and smoothed, whereas others are highly irregular and stick out from the wall. These two magnificent lions, each carved out of the single monolithic block, maybe because of their tongues, look, I don't know, tired and quite harmless to me. Perhaps if I had seen them thousands of years ago with black pupils and undamaged, I would have been more scared. Nevertheless, they are beautifully crafted, especially their mane and whiskers. The first traces of small settlements were found in this area on mountain slopes and rocky outcroppings and date back to the 5th millennium BC. It wasn't until 2000 years later, in the 3rd millennium BC, during the early Bronze Age, that small settlements evolved into religious, political and trade centers, probably due to discovery and processing of the mineral sources, metals and wood. These settlements were established by Hattians, Hittites' predecessors, who named the site Hattush. We encountered another insane structure known as the complex of Yenicekale. The artificial terrace measures 28 by 25 meters. The wall reaches 7 meters in height and some blocks weigh up to 3 tons. The purpose of this structure hasn't been found out yet, but it's possible that it had ritual meaning as well as Sarikale. We're now at the highest and southernmost point in the city. This artificial hill is called Yerkape, meaning gate in the earth, and includes a 71 meters long cobalt tunnel built of extremely large boulders. Interestingly enough, the floor was initially covered with a white layer to enhance visibility. Just take a look at how huge this gateway is! A 
at the top of this 30 meters high hill stands the Sphinx Gate. This is the best example of Mesopotamian influence on Hittite art. Both figures remind me of the Assyrian protective deity Lamassu from Dur Sharukin, but instead of having a bull's body, they have a body of a lioness. However, as you know, I'm an Egyptomaniac and when I saw these beautifully chiseled rosettes above the Sphinx's head, I instantly thought about the Egyptian two feathers crown. This whole artificial hill, along with its magnificent sphinxes, probably wasn't built as a strictly defensive point. It was some kind of a monument which demonstrated the power of Hittites and aimed to impress travelers approaching the city from the south. The Assyrians, who traded with Hattians and introduced them to cuneiform writing on clay tablets, founded the city of Kanish or Nesha, around 160 km to the southeast of Hattush. The region grew in power, the Assyrian traders were paying taxes and were protected by the Hattian lords in return, but in 1700 BC, Anita, the king of Kushar, the city location, still remains unknown, defeated Hattian king, destroyed and burned the city of Hattush, and chose the city of Kanish as his capital. The King's Gate, located on the eastern side of the southern city wall, actually does not represent a king, not a warrior. The size of the breast made some scholars believe that it actually may be she, not he. But finally, after closer investigation and discovery of a hair depicted on the chest, it was decided that this 2.25 meters high sculpture was a god, probably Sharuma, as he features horns on the helmet the attribute of the Hittite gods. The oldest text in Hittite language, and actually the oldest Indo-European text altogether, is the so-called Anita text written on the tablet with a cuneiform script. After destroying and burning Hattush, Anita cursed the city, saying, quote, At night I took the city by force. I have sown weeds in its place. Should any king after me attempt to settle Hattush, may the weather god of heaven strike him down." Unquote. However, we can see that the curse didn't stop Hittite kings from creating an extensive two square kilometer city, which was a capital of a mighty Hittite empire. This militaristic society was one of the most powerful of the Late Bronze Age, along with Egyptians, Babylon and Assyrians. They were repeatedly mentioned in the Bible. Hittites are actually initiators of the Iron Age, as they were the first producing advanced iron goods, which were softer and lighter than those made of bronze. We're now seeing remains of the Buyuk Kala, the royal castle located in the highest point of the old city. It served as a residence of the Hittite kings. Hittite high status among dominant powers of the time presents the story of Zananza, son of Shupiluliuma I. He almost became an Egyptian pharaoh in the 4th century BC. Tutankhamun's widowed wife, Ankhesenamun, wrote a letter to Shupiluliuma.
my husband has died and I have no son. They say about you that you have many sons. You might give me one of your sons to become my husband. I would not wish to take one of my subjects as a husband. I am afraid. After the successful journey of Shupilul Yuma's emissary, Zananza was sent to Egypt but never reached the Egyptian border, dying during the journey. It's still unknown what exactly happened and how he died. Just to keep you informed, the circular route around the site is around 6 km in total, 3 km uphill and 3 downhill. I'm glad that it's not the other way around. This is the hieroglyphic chamber too built by the last king of Hittites, Shupiluluma II, around 1200 BC. It was unfortunately extremely hard to film. Reliefs and inscriptions adorning its inside walls led the scholars to believe that it was a kind of symbolic gateway to the world of the dead. After reaching its peak under the reign of Shupiluluma I and then his son Murshili, in the end of the 14th century BC, the Hittites were continually invaded by the Assyrians. Later on, the Sea Peoples took over trade routes on the Mediterranean. The Hittites were also invaded by the Phrygians and the Kashkas. Finally, in 1180 BC, Hattusa was burned down. The fall of the Hittite Empire was a part of the Late Bronze Age Collapse, a time of disruption of trade and diplomatic relations, the disappearance of writing systems, destruction and death on a large scale. The Mediterranean civilizations either collapsed, Hittites, Mycenaeans, Levant, or remained but significantly weakened, Assyria or Egypt. Hattusa was completely abandoned for more than 300 years to be then settled by the Phrygians. Thank you for watching. If you liked it, you might also enjoy my previous video from Derinkuyu and playlists from Greece and Egypt. Links below. I am still exploring Turkey, so if you want to stay up to date with new episodes, please subscribe to my channel. See you on another ancient site!